So I, th I think I should get started, even if there's people still, still rolling in. Um, over the past couple of years, I've, I've run a thing called the Smarks Colloquium, our Special Masters Colloquium, um, which is a sort of shock and awe course where you, you take the incoming masters and try to startle them with uh, sort of exemplary um, but often radical perspectives and things. And I've, I've uh, enjoyed enormously being able to reach out across the scientific community in MIT and Harvard and <clears throat> have had the good fortune uh, to, to persuade these three um, extraordinary scientists to, to come and speak to us. And it's uh, enormously influenced the students. I mean, they have just thrilled to this work. I can't tell you how much discussion it's, uh, they've provoked. Um, so I thought I would try it on the, on the wider, wider audience of uh, ACSA. Uh, so the, the three, if I introduce them, uh, Dan Nachera, and I'll introduce them sort of formally as, uh, in, in turn, but Dan Nachera, who is uh, a chemist working on energy. Um, Chris Nagel, who is a chemist physicist working on material. And Mark Kishner, who's a biologist working on biosystems. Um, I find each of their perspectives uh, relevant, uh, and I, I enjoy speculating on the kind of insights that, that their work is giving, and, and so I offer it in that, in that spirit. It's, uh, it's tantalizingly on the horizon, but I think it's, um, it, it, it merits being, being talked about. So in turn, I'm going to ask uh, Dan Nachera to speak first, but he, he received his uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Rutgers, uh, PhD in chemistry from California Institute of Technology. Uh, worked with Harry Gray, studying sp spectroscopy, electrochemistry, photochemistry of polynuclear metal-metal bonded complexes. Joined the faculty of Michigan State. 1984, um, he moved to Massachusetts Institute of Technology as professor of chemistry in 1997. And he's pre presently the Henry Dreyfus Professor of Energy and Professor of Chemistry at MIT. Uh, Dan and his researchers received media attention beginning really in 2007 when he declared that a better understanding of photosynthesis process could lead to economical storage of solar em energy as a chemical fuel. He later announced that the group had developed a highly efficient anode electrocatalyst, cobalt phosphate, for use in electrolysis of water, employing inexpensive materials. His work on artificial photosynthesis centers around the, ba centers around the basic mechanisms of energy conversion in biology and chemistry. Um, da, 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 da. In October 2010, and it was the day before he came and spoke to our group, he signed with the Tata Group in India to commercialize his research. And I'm sure he'll, he'll talk about that. And most recently, he's, he's just announced a move to Harvard in support of that research. Right? Uh, he's received the American Institute of Chemists Award, 1979. Energy Ital Gas Prize for the Energy and the Environment, 2005, elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, received the Inter-American Photochemistry Award, Berkhausen Chemistry Award, American Chemical Society Award in Inorganic Chemistry. He's published over 225 papers and served on scientific advisory boards and editorial boards of several large corporations. He was the inaugural editor of Inorganic Chemistry Communications and the inaugural chair of the editorial board for Chemsys Chem. So I, what, in listening to him, I think his synopsis of global energy needs and their link to economic prosperity and quality of life is startling. His account of the current options of wind, nuclear, solar in respect of such needs is alarming. His advocacy for clean coal as a bridging technology is sobering, given his, his advocacy of artificial photosynthesis. Yet it's his vision of a radically alternative approach to meeting global energy needs that seems to me hugely compelling and hopeful and likely to decisively alter the energy debate. Turn the chair. If we do 
15, 20 minutes for each, each of the speakers and then try to have a discussion and open it to questions. We'll try to aim for that. This thing is you, okay. I'll just be fine. Okay, so um, what I'll do is talk a little bit about global energy so you know what you're in for. Uh, you're screwed, so don't worry about it. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about um, a, a way maybe around this problem and actually give you a message of hope. And then I'll end with um, this invention we just did, which is called the artificial leaf, and I'll show you how that works. And so uh, I've done a lot of global energy calculations, and what you find is uh, this is, again, a power unit, so it's not energy. It's you need energy to run the light bulb. And you, you right now, you're running a, basically a 14 trillion watt light bulb. So that's energy per unit time. So you don't need to worry about if I'm talking about a year or a day. It's power. And so you're burning a big light bulb globally. It's 14 terawatts. And you can see by 2050, you're going to need 16 trillion watts more. So you're going to top out at 30. And what you can start doing is calculating total energy content. So this is basically looking at everything at 10,000 feet. And you can find some really striking things, for instance, in biomass, anything biological. What I did is I took the fastest growing crops, and the fastest growing crops store 1% of solar energy in biomass. And then I said, I'm going to plant. I took the entire face of the earth. And wherever I could grow crops, I put those plants. And then I harvested those plants. And when you burn the biomass, the best burn you can do is to go to carbon dioxide. So I didn't even worry about whether we have the technologies to do this. But I took the entire amount of energy out of the plant. And you only get six terawatts. Right? And I've covered the entire face of the planet with fast-growing crops. So, and, and the reason is, is by, poor little plants didn't realize they were supposed to be oil wells for you. So they're just like you. You eat food, but you burn the energy. Plants didn't realize they were supposed to be storing it to take care of your energy needs. They have to live. And so they're very efficient in terms of energy, but they're efficient at energy use, not energy storage, right? And then nuclear, there's a good one. Um, I, you can take a nuclear power plant that puts out only a gig, puts out a gigawatt. You don't like building them bigger, because if you do, they get dangerous. And so if I wanted half my energy, say, from nuclear, that's eight terawatts, I'm gonna need 16. And you take eight terawatts and divide it by a gigawatt, and that gives you 8,000. And I'm gonna need that in the next 40 years, so 8,000 divided by 40 is 200. So you have to build me a new nuclear power plant every day and a half. And I say forever because at 50 years, out of safety concerns, you decommission a nuclear power plant. So the one that you just built a day and a half from now, you'll have to get ready to start decommissioning and building a new one to replace it. So that's why you're going to be building nuclear power plants every day and a half forever, right, to keep up with eight terawatts. And then there are other things like wind. Um, if you can put your hand th through something this easily, don't use it as an energy source, okay? And so you can, you can go on and do these calculations, and this is why you see people really care about solar, because there's a lot of it. And, it, and for me, it's distributed and dispersed. So I'm not going to fight that, you'll see as I move along. I'm actually going to take advantage of having the sun distributed, and the argument in a nutshell will be we should just go to decentralized solar energy in the future. All right. 
Now, you could ask, when I made this assumption of needing 16 terawatts, I had to make some assumption about energy conservation. And the first kind of bad thing is, that I assume by 2050 you would be able to save 14 terawatts. So, especially for this crowd and energy efficiency, I hope you do your job because I made the assumption that you're going to save every bit of energy you use today and I still need 16 terawatts. If you don't do that, I'm going to, I'm going to need 30 terawatts, not 16. So that's not a good thing. And then you can ask, well, if I'm such a great society and I'm saving all my energy, why do I need 16 terawatts? And this is our egocentricity. Um, it has nothing to do with us, right? So there's three billion new people to come and there's three billion really low energy users. So your future in energy ha has nothing to do with you except that please, be energy efficient, I need you to. But the real drivers are mostly the poor of the world. That's, that's where it's gonna be, that's where the action is. And it's gonna be these six billion new people or new energy users, they're the ones driving the 16 terawatts for the future. And so that means, and actually from the last session I heard it, um, I'm going to show you the worst thing you can do is take current energy technologies designed for this part of society and then try to force it to the poor. It never works. And the reason is you guys have money, so you like energy efficiency, and with efficiency comes cost. Okay? And so, and there are things to make something efficient scientifically you have what's called balance of systems cost. So if I make something tinier, I have to still scale the balance of systems. And at some point, the balance of systems don't scale. And so you kind of level off at a high cost. So the only way you're going to get to the poor with energy, and I'll make that argument in a few minutes, is you have to design from the ground up with them in mind and with dollar bills in mind, so low cost. And actually, you guys can do this at home, since you, you're architects and you probably know people who do construction. What I did is, look, I went and just did a Google. I don't do research anymore. I sit in my, lab, my office and I get on Google. And then I tell my students, look what I discovered. And then they say, go back to your office, please. And so here's my latest uh, discovery. I took a Boeing 777. And I said, how much does it weigh and how much does it cost to make? And I normalized the cost with the weight of it. And then I said, how many did they make? And in 19, 2006, they made 74 Boeing 777s. Then I did it for etching tools, machine tools, and automobiles. What's interesting is if you look at that curve, no matter what the technology is, if it's going to be something you're manufacturing. So this doesn't work for pharma, Intel chips commodity chemicals like oil, but for anything you're building or manufacturing, there's, the bottom line is it's going to cost $10 per pound, and I don't even know what, need to know what it looks like. And I did call McDonald's, and I asked them how much the buns weighs, tomato, lettuce, hamburger, and how much they pay for it. It's $10 per pound. So as far as I'm concerned, um, a McDonald's hamburger and a car are the same thing from a manufacturing point of view. And why this is instructive, it tells you why you'll fail if you try to build your society for the poor. Because what you guys do is you build one big thing, even at $10 per pound, it's heavy, it's expensive. But because you have money, I can set up a cost model, right, return on investment, charge you money and make back my capital expenditure and then make a profit. The problem with that is poor people don't have money. And so that's why, thank God, they don't have an energy system yet where they would build what we have, which would really be catastrophic. And so this is why I'm saying most things developed in this society, isn't, they aren't going to scale well to the poor. So you have to do business in a new way. And so, Mark mentioned photosynthesis. I'm just going to tell you how it works quickly. 
and maybe you remember this from grade school, you have a plant, light comes into it, it splits water to hydrogen and oxygen. And then the hydrogen gets fixed with CO2 and you make sugar, carbohydrates, cellulose, lignin. But what most people don't realize is all the energy from the sun is stored in water splitting. Once you get the hydrogen, and nature uses a form of hydrogen called NADPH, it's not important. The plant then fixes hydrogen with CO2 to make the carbohydrate, but you get no extra energy storage there. It's totally a, what's called thermoneutral reaction. The plant's only doing that because it can't deal with gaseous hydrogen easily. So all the solar energy is stored in water splitting, splitting of water to hydrogen and oxygen. And the way I'll show that is first tell you what a fuel is. There's your gasoline, carbon, 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 hydrogen bonds, and oxygen. And now I'm going to burn it. So watch this. See, you get CO2 and water. Watch it again. It's 14 hours of PowerPoint to do this. <laughs> OK. So what I just did is I took, what you're doing is you're taking high energy bonds, that's what you're doing when you're burning your fuel, and then you rearrange the bonds to low energy content bonds and you use the energy. So what photosynthesis is doing, it's taking low energy bonds in water and then using sunlight with the leaf as the intermediary, it, the leaf is taking the sunlight and causing the bonds of water to rearrange the hydrogen and oxygen. And that's how you're storing sunlight, right? And that hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen gets fixed with CO2. You then eat the sugar. You get rid of the CO2 again. You get it back down to hydrogen. And then in your body, you have this enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. It's fed the hydrogen and oxygen. It's a fuel cell. And that's why you're still, that's why you're moving right now. That's called mitochondrial respiration. So you're just undoing what a plant does inside your body. And you're taking the solar light that was transformed or stored in these rearranged bonds, and then you basically eat the stuff, and then you release the sunlight inside your body. So when you eat green leafy vegetables, and I'm not kidding you, the thing you're chewing is sunlight, and you're releasing the sunlight inside you. And that's why you're all such bright, shiny people. Okay, so that's how photosynthesis works. And now here's the message of hope. And it's something to keep in mind as you move forward in terms of an energy system. Uh, I am the ultra conservative in energy, right, arguments. Republicans who want to use oil, Sarah Palin, drill, baby drill. She is the most liberal person in the world because Oil has only been around for around 150 years. This has been going on for 2.5 billion years. And so I'm a real throwback. I want to do what's been working for 2.5 billion years. I don't want this new fancy experiment of burning coal, oil, and gas, which is only a 100-year experiment. So I like to tell everybody on the Hill I'm the conservative in the energy game, all right, by doing this. And here's your message of hope because that's the MIT swimming pool. Now, if I could build an energy system and give it to everybody, especially six billion poor people, and then have sunlight operate on the water and make hydrogen and oxygen. Now, this is per second, so everybody is Equivalent, equivalently, if they could take a pool of water per second to hydrogen and oxygen, and you're not using the water up because when the hydrogen and oxygen are separated, you burn them, you get the energy back, and you get water back again. So it's a closed system in water, it's just sunlight in, energy out. If I could take that pool of water to hydrogen and oxygen per second to get it to a power, guess how much energy I can store? 48 terawatts, okay? You only need 16. So what I'm telling you is I need to have an energy system that's basically only operating on a third of a pool of water globally, and I can give you clean carbon neutral energy. So sunlight in, 
I have to design something that can then act on water to make hydrogen and oxygen per second that's equivalent to a pool. And it will be distributed so you'll, I'll have your little glass of water and that will amount to one pool of water, okay? And so that's the message of hope. That, that's not such a hard thing to start thinking about. Okay, so to just show you what we've done, I'm just gonna tell you in photosynthesis, what happens is light comes in. The plant can't get its hands on light, so it makes a wireless current, like you get out of the wall, but with no wires. And for every bit of sunlight that comes in, you get one unit of wireless current the water splitting reaction needs four units of charge, or four units of current. And so the plant does it one time, two times, three times, four times. It gets a current that's four units of charge. Then it splits water to hydrogen and oxygen. So in design, this is really a design project, what I need to do is build something that can take sunlight in, make a unit of charge, store the unit of charge in things called catalysts that then work on water to split it to hydrogen and oxygen. And so this is what we did just a few, a year ago. Um, we had made catalysts, the blue box and red box are chemical things that we made. They're catalysts that could split water to O2 and it could, the other catalysts could make hydrogen, like platinum, but we made a cheap platinum, earth abundant platinum. And if I can use a semiconductor like silicon, light can come in, I can make the wireless charge with the semiconductor, and then have the wireless charge stored in my catalyst and I could split water. And so I'm just gonna end with this and show you, we, this right here is a piece, the ASI, ASI, GI, that whole middle part, that's the silicon. Then we put a little protective barrier, that's called the conducting glass effectively, indium tin oxide or fluorinated tin oxide. Then I put one of my catalysts up on top and the other catalyst, the blue thing on the bottom. So now when sunlight comes in, it does exactly what I said. The, the silicon is the orange middle box. It absorbs the light, it generates the current, and then my catalysts catch it, okay? And so what I'm gonna show you now, and there are no wires. This is all just coatings. So earlier this year, we did this. Um, by the way, I tried to, st I started this at 19 years old. I wanted to do this, so now that I've done it, I just sit in my office and watch this thing bubble all day. I'm, I'm just mesmerized by it. But this is just a piece of silicon with my coatings on it. There's a lot of science that had to be invented in this catalyst design. Don't worry about it. But now you're gonna see one, one sun come on. Where's my sun? I guess I gotta hit play. So now you're gonna see sunlight come on. That's one sun. And it's just what I showed you, a thin piece of silicon, and then on this side, on the front side, is this oxygen evolving catalyst we made, and then on the back side is the hydrogen. And you can see now, just literally putting this in, hold, putting it in a glass of water, holding it up to sunlight, you start splitting the water. And so now I'm, I'm taking sunlight and I'm storing it in these rearranged bonds of oxygen and hydrogen. It's spatially separated. I'm letting it mix above, but you wouldn't do that in a real design. You just take the oxygen from one side, the hydrogen's on the back side. So there's the oxygen just bubbling up and there's the hydrogen on the back side. And it's working just like a leaf in concept. Light in, wireless current, multi-electron, water splitting. Okay, um, no membrane because these catalysts are selective for oxygen and hydrogen. So I don't even need a membrane, it's just simply coatings. And that's getting to this idea that I talked to you about of what we call fast food energy, McDonald's, because you can now just imagine having just silicon coming down the pike and you're just spraying on coatings and you're gonna to have to do manufacturing at that rate to keep up with six billion people, but now they can literally, you can start thinking about designing an energy system, catch the hydrogen and oxygen, and then burn it. And like Mark mentioned, so we really have moved out 
on this part of the diagram, highly distributed energy in a simple engineered device with inexpensive materials. And as Mark mentioned, uh, in India, I'll just say in the next uh, 15 years, 352 million people will come from the poor to the rising middle class. And Mr. Todd has been imploring the society to start work worrying about them. And so uh, Mr. Tata and I now are working really hard and stay tuned. Uh, we have some prototypes made and we'll be driving hard into India in the next uh, few years. Next, uh, Mark Kirshner, who I um, first met actually well, three or four years ago, I guess. Uh, Mark Kirshner graduated from Northwestern University, um, received his doctorate at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, held postdoc positions at the University of Oxford in England and Princeton, made professor at the University of California, San Francisco, moved then to Harvard Medical School. Uh, in 1999, he was elected a foreign member of the Royal Society and a foreign member of the Academia Europea. He was the 2001 recipient of the William C. Rose Award presented by the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Later that year, he received the 2001 Gardner Foundation International Award. In December 2003, he received the E.B. Wilson Medal, the highest scientific honor from the American Society for Cell Biology, in recognition of significant and far-reaching contributions to cell biology over the course of a career. In 2004, he became head of the, what I think is the newest department in Cambridge, the Department of Systems Biology at Harvard. His publications are with John Gerhard, Cells, Embryos, and Evolution Towards a Cellular and Developmental Understanding of Phenotyp Phenotypic uh, Variation and Evolution, Evolutionary Adaptability, and also with John Gerhard, The Plausibility of Life, Resolving Darwin's Dilemma, which uh, I recommend to you as a hugely accessible book. So I first met Mark at a, a conversation on complex systems at the GSD a few years ago, and I was, I was humbled by the humility with which he approaches what he calls the origins of novelty in nature. I remember him likening the genome project to having a jumbo jet dismantled and laid out on the tarmac, and someone encouraging that even with the blueprints lost, if you put it together right, it'll fly. The biosystems department under Mark's leadership brings together a diverse range of disciplines, as even a resident artist who presents back the work in, a, in different ways, to try to gain insight into the mechanisms of biological systems, you know, robust and brilliantly variant as they are. I conjecture that the steady exposure of the constrained yet open generative logic of biosystems will have profound impact on all areas of human endeavor, not least the creative arts and architecture. A legitimate biomimicry, it seems to me, would be to understand the deep logics of biology, not the look of it, and I think profound lessons can be learned for you know, parametric or rule-based generative processes from the insights already being offered by Dr. Kirshner and his team. And even the manner of the collaborative research, which seems atypical for science. Um, so welcome, Mark Kirshner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I, um, I never know whether knowing something about evolution is really helpful to uh, architects. Uh, my recent encounter with architecture was remodeling our uh, kitchen, and I don't think it would have helped at all. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, that, the process that I saw operating wouldn't have produced human beings. and in the time that life occurred on the earth either, so we moved into something to evolution after all. Uh, the, main, the main point here from the point of view of trying to say something that may be of relevance and maybe not of relevance to architecture, but certainly maybe of interest, um, is that uh, biology uh, operates under a lot of constraints. And, um, and we just heard about one of the major constraints, which is uh, energy 
access to energy or conversion of, of abundant energy into something useful for biology. And, um, and uh, these constraints, uh, you know, we can, we can all, um, uh, we've all experienced them, but, um, but in some ways, uh, biology is uh, a system for avoiding constraints, for creating opportunities. And we've seen all this diversity of life on this planet, including photosynthesis, as amazing forms of invention. And, um, and what I, one of the things I really want to say is that um, constraint and also deconstraint, uh, that is prop, uh, processes that will make it possible to um, avoid some of the constraints is really a, a task that biology has and maybe one shared by many human endeavors, including architecture. Um, and maybe what's not so obvious, but maybe more obvious uh, uh, after this talk, is that uh, deconstraint uh, often takes place by inventing highly constrained systems. So uh, maybe the one difference, maybe not, between biology and, and architecture is that uh, biology is always a work in progress. Uh, that um, not only do you have to have rules for um, uh, creating structure, which would be embryonic development, which is complicated enough, going from a single cell to a multicellular organism. But in some ways, there must be embedded in the process that biology uses methods for transforming one, uh, one structure into another. And you can't start from scratch. You have to build on what you already have. And uh, that's sort of what is particularly fascinating. Um, now, uh, so I want to um, just remind people about the theory of evolution. Uh, the f first part of it is the question of variation. That's an, an inherent part. So that individuals and populations vary genetically and also consequently vary in their um, traits and, their, and also their capacity to and contribute to the next generation. The second component of evolutionary theory is selection. That is, uh, competition leads to the selection of a subset of those individuals. And the most fit ones can be said to be uh, ones that contribute the most progeny to the next generation. The per third part of that process is uh, heredity. And that when you select a subset of that population that has some, uh, some favorable properties, you're also selecting with that in those individuals their genomes, their, their DNA, their sequences of, of genes. And this uh, gets inherited in each generation and uh, therefore changes the properties of the population, though not changing the property of the individual. And the result of this is evolution, and the population is said to have evolved under selection. So these are the kind of general principles um, made more modern than Darwin would have been able to say in 1859 when he wrote The Origin of Species. Uh, and of those principles, um, the one that has received the least attention uh, is the first one, that is how does variation occur? And what kind of variation occurs? I mean, you can imagine, and this is, gets us into the current you know, debates in the, you know, in the, about the intelligent design and all these things, also come down to this issue. I mean, if, if variation uh, was very difficult to achieve, then all the selection in the world isn't going to get you what you want. And if variation, in fact, is very specific, only certain types of variation could pr be produced, then selection becomes less important. So there's something about variation in biology which is effective, copious, uh, and, um, and, uh, and that's who I want to devote our, our this talk too. Now, to understand variation, one has to understand the materials upon which biology is built, because the next species or the next improvement is going to be built with the same general materials that the previous species was built. So the, the, the insight as to what makes evolution work is much about the kinds of ways in which materials can be converted, rearranged, and, and new structures can be generated. And as I said, one of the reasons that this was ignored for so long, uh, well, it was actually an obsession of people in Darwin's time, 
But after genetics was uh, rediscovered and Mendel's laws, and it got set to the side. And that was, it's only been and very recently that we have a good understanding, and still rather imperfect understanding, but a much better understanding of how life uh, is built and how, um, uh, uh, how structure and functions uh, occurs at the level of the molecular level and, um, and how information is converted from DNA into the phenotype, uh, including structure and behavior and everything else. So that was missing for very good reasons. So where does variation come from? This is um, Ernst Haeckel, who was a famous developmental biologist and um, a famous evolutionary biologist. And he's also a fantastic artist. And these are faces of bats. And uh, they're cute animals, I'm sure very, very attractive to the ones of the same species. And you look at all this variation, and you know, I just wonder, how, how could nature be so creative? Now, the thing we want to ask is, how is easy is it to generate useful variation? Is it hard to achieve? Is it easy to achieve? And one of the things that was striking, even back in the 19th century, was that uh, basic features don't change very much. So here we see uh, three vertebrate animals, a whale, a human, and a giraffe. All of them have seven cervical vertebrae in their spine at the, at the neck. But the one, relatively speaking, in the whale is, are just compressed very short. Humans are a little longer. The giraffe is a lot longer. So you didn't add new cervical vertebrae. It just changed the size of the cervical vertebrae. So you can imagine there's a strategy here which allows for some sort of uh, ease of, of modification, yet maintaining some of the features in a very conserved way. So and we see this, of course, in lots of other things. But, so how are novel varieties generated? by random mutation. And um, some people th uh, get confused about novelty that arises in genetics, which can be random, but novelty that arises in structure can't be random. What does it mean for a, 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 an organism to change randomly? I don't even know what that means. Does it mean more fingers or wings from the top of their head? Or, I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't even compute. Um, now, on the gene level, we now know there's much less novelty and much more conservation than ever expected. So the human genome has only about 21,000 genes. It's only about one and a half times the number of genes that a fruit fly has. And many of these genes are the same. About half of them are the same in, in, uh, in type. So that was very reassuring from the point of view of Darwin's view that we arose from some common source and we share a lot with uh, other organisms. But it, of course, raises the question about where novelty comes from, because everything is pretty much the same. How do you get novelty? So um, we now know that innovation came, that st structural innovation, or, or really, I, I would say, uh, the, the materials of biology came in waves. So that there was a, you know, back 3.8 billion years ago, we had the origin of life, metabolism, DNA, membranes, lots of other things, ribosomes. And then they didn't change very much for the next 3.8 billion years. And, uh, and those are the kind of things you learn about in, in biochemistry courses. And so they start boring because for 3.8 billion years, nothing changes. But cell biology courses usually teach the origin of complex cells. Again, they arise, and we have the nucleus, we have the chromosomes, we have uh, all sorts of other properties, cell cycle. And then and that doesn't change much. In multicellularity, a billion years ago, and of course, the famous Cambrian explosion, where all, essentially all the phyla were established 530 million years ago, and again, stasis. And during the time in which there's stasis in, this, in these fundamental core processes, there's a lot of reorganization of these properties and, and remixing re, uh, of them in new ways. So it's almost like you, know, you start out, and I shouldn't use architectural analogies, but I might have used them even if I weren't here. You know, it's as if you have stone to work with, and you can do a lot with it. And then someone invents uh, something else, like maybe steel, and you can do a lot with that. So those inventions come quite rarely. And what happens in the interim is the re use of these things in novel ways, rather than the invention of whole suites of new things. Well, um, mutation is random, but Modification of underlying structure it depends a lot on how modifiable is structure. So we think about structure. We think about wood. 
and all the things you could do with wood. It's a very modifiable structure. And so we ought to be asking ourselves, what is it about biology which is so modifiable? Is it somehow built in such a way that it lends itself to novelty? Well, um, there are always constraints, and sometimes and you have to build on the previous structure. You can start with a Romanesque church and build a Gothic cathedral on top of it. It's not, it's not, um, uh, it's not it's starting from scratch. Um, and these, but, uh, but, but I'm sort of interested in these constraints. Are these constraints globally constraining? Might there even be constraints that though in themselves make certain things hard to change, actually facilitate greater change around them? And these are things I'm particularly interested in. So we, maybe the best way is to go to human examples where we see things like, you know, at the beginning with the railroads, they were all different gauges. Uh, there certainly was a compromise to put them all in the same gauge, but that allowed a lot of interconnectability. You didn't have to unload cars onto other cars. You could just move them one track to another. We have certain types of caliber of screws. We have integrated chips. We have Lego things where you can build anything on Lego, and yet they're very simple and very few things. We have constraints in the keyboards we use and then lots of other items in our, and in these constraints, I would argue, like the ones that are, I'm gonna talk about in biology, um, are, they're, they're very constraining. That is, if the Lego pieces were not made to high precision, you'd have a lot of frustrated children trying to build things. And we know that what the, how bad that would be. And if, the, and if the screws were not made to a certain level of precision, uh, we would, uh, you know, we would have trouble putting together things. So, so the constraints are constraining, and they're not optimized for everything, but they do lead us to provide the ability uh, to do lots of, of, of things, many of which were not conceived of when, when, when the first uh, components were, 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 were standardized. Okay, so how do biological systems generate variation? What are the constraints, and are these constraints possibly also deconstraining? So I want to focus on complex structural novelty. Like, the, like this, uh, this has a, someone who knows a lot of biology, this, there's a certain kind of um, lesson behind this, because all these fantastic structures all come from a certain type of cell that was invested, invented in the early vertebrates called the neural crest. And you can see it's capable of doing a lot of different odd things. Okay. Now, animal organization is not a simple repetition of local organization, and, um, it, but it has, uh, it has its own sort of complexity to it. Now, um, so multicellular organisms clearly have done wonderful things, and they have means of officially generating structure and embryonic development, but they also provide a basis for what I will call evolvability, which is a measure of the efficiency of generating novelty in evolution. So what is the evolvability? This is the kind of thing I want to come to because I want to argue that ev evolvability, that is, uh, are, are the actual processes, not the genetics, but the, the processes themselves. And these things must have the following properties. They maximize variation for a given amount of mutation. So it's easy to get a lot of variation. On the other hand, they suppress lethality of the variation produced because only non-lethal variation contributes to evolution. If you die and you don't have children, you could be the greatest organism in the world, but you're not gonna, the, the, the population is not gonna evolve. And the most peculiar quality is it has to provide useful variation even for conditions not previously encountered. And you think about that a little bit because um, that sort of seems like uh, some sort of uh, imagination that you wouldn't expect to exist in a, in a, in a completely in a, uh, you know, natural world. But we see that all the time. Um, and I, if you think, uh, um, I'm just gonna, I was gonna go on to this, I'll come back to this, but if we think about the power grid for a moment, it's just as an example of what, um, what I'm talking about, of, of creating, of constraints, uh, facilitating variation, even of things that have never been conceived of before. What we have in this power grid is we have a, a, a set of wires, essentially, and transformers. And on one end, we have a power plant. 
And at the other end, uh, we have uses. And we have plugs, although I have to admit that if we travel, we find some of the frustrations of not of lack of standardization in plugs. That could be improved. But um, you can plug anything into the power plant. You can plug in the, you know, the artificial uh, leaf that we just heard about, and it will, you don't have to change that power grid. You might decentralize it, but there'll still be some wires and some way of delivering it. And, uh, and, and when you plug into that power grid, it doesn't have to be something that we knew about when we designed that power grid in the first place. So, computers and there were all sorts of devices that no one could even conceive of when Edison and other people were, tr were, were, um, were um, in America, at least, were, were uh, building power lines all over the place. So let's see, so I just want to say, so uh, there are, um, f we've identified four major um, strategies that make organisms so evolvable. This is, again, in terms of the nature of the processes uh, that are highly conserved, but are used over and over again in different ways. And um, I want to give you at least a little taste of the biological side of this, because I'm sure you will understand power grids, but this part you may not have encountered before. So, um, so one is weak linkage, which is a special biological kind of interconnectability. Another, which is quintessentially biological, but I don't think it has to be limited to biology, in fact isn't, are exploratory processes, which is the use of the organism of the intentional production of random variation followed by selection. So we're not talking about evolution now, we're talking about what happens in the course of one's life. And then compartmentation, which is a way of repurposing common elements in, for very diff dis different tasks at different sites in the body. This is very important because if you try to optimize something for your foot, you may not have optimized it for your hand. You want to have, and, and that, that would require every part of the body to be uh, somehow have a different co collection of, of components. And as we saw, we only have slightly fewer genes than a fruit fly has, and so uh, that constraint would have, would have driven us to make many more genes, each for different local tasks. The last one I'm not going to talk about. Uh, about um, so let me just talk about weak linkage. So biological processes are built by putting other processes together. And, um, and this means there must be, there's these retooling inputs and outputs requires minimal creativity and minimal new mutations. Now, this is not a trivial property. Um, Partly it's a question of the complexity of the information required to get a complex response. You want to build something complex, something new. You want to build the brain or the heart or the placenta or something that hasn't been seen before. Uh, it's a complicated task. And, uh, but biology does it in an odd way. It splits the information content between the initiator of the task, which has low information content, and some, some uh, module which has high information content, which in fact itself is conserved. Um, so, and this process in biology uh, leads to a kind of engineering that uh, requires less mutation and is more robust. So it's not like a Rube Goldberg device where everything has to be, you know, kind of uh, set just perfectly or the, you know, the, the water isn't going to land on the head and the ball isn't going to, everything has to be worked perfectly and it's very hard to retool this thing. Instead, it's something much more flexible. Now, I'll give one example of this. There are many examples. And that is of a nerve cell. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a one minute um, description of how nerves work. Nerves, all nerves. And all, all, every nerve in our body, every nerve in the body of any organism, basically is a two-state system. In one state, it's a resting state, and not, nothing is happening. And there, the, there, it has a certain charge across its membrane, uh, where it's more negative on the inside of the cell and, and more positive on the outside of the cell. And then it has a firing state. And the firing state is, uh, uh, it, what it does is it causes secretion of neurotransmitters down at the nerve terminal, down at the end of the axon here. So it's just a question of flipping between those two states. And now how 
do you retool the nervous system? Well, you have new inputs and you have new output and you, have, uh, and you regulate an output in this case. The inputs are things called ion channels, receptors, all sorts of fancy machinery that gets very rapidly evolved in evolution and all that's stuck up somewhere in the, somewhere in the cell, anywhere in the cell, but typically up where the dendrites are at the far left. And, um, and when you do that, uh, uh, you don't have to connect them to the output. You don't have to make new connections between inputs and outputs because all it does is change the electrical potential across the membrane. So you can take a, an ion channel from a yeast cell and put it into a human uh, neuron, it'll work perfectly well. It, there's, uh, there's no physical tool, retooling that has to take place. The linkage is so weak, there's no physical interaction at all. And this obviously facilitates rampant new input-output connections without having to engineer something where there's a connect, physical connection between the input and output. So in, in biology, um, the way these, these core processes that are going to be put together work is they're often easily inhibited, often they're auto-inhibited, they inhibit themselves, and they're just released by simple signals. And these simple signals can easily evolve, but they can, uh, they can uh, entrain with them very complex outputs. Um, and the actual interactions physically can be weak. They don't even have to be weak in terms of the, uh, the distance or the conceptualization. They can actually have essentially very little physical interaction. All right, so that's, that covers a huge number of things from gene regulation uh, to metabolism to lots of other things. Now, exploratory process. This is kind of quintessentially biological thing. When a nerve is growing out, let's say, to connect to some muscle or some region of the body, how does it know where to grow? Now, uh, this is, uh, it does have some, there are nerves that have certain signals and, and guideposts that tell them which way to grow, but in many cases, it's done the following way. You grow out in all directions, randomly. And superfluous numbers of nerves grow out from a, from a ganglion, let's say. And then if they hit a region that is the region you want it to hit, those nerves uh, are stabilized. The, otherwise, the, uh, the nerves, they grow out after a while, they commit suicide and they die. But if they hit one of these things labeled NGF, they're physically stabilized and they'll may be maintained. So the connection is not a connection of instructions that says, you know, go to, like, a, like Google Maps or something, go this way, turn left, go so many miles, turn right. But it's, just, it's an exploration of space. And if you hit the right spot, then you're stabilized. And if you hit the wrong spot, you die. And this process, which exists in so many areas of biology, the immune system being one of them, is always the explanation of last resort. Nobody will believe that things can be generated by random variation and selection. And that, of course, was the great argument against Darwin's evolution in the begin with, which is another process that involves random uh, variation and selection. So um, this is a major way in which the, now you can imagine how robust that is. Because if, you're, if your body is not perfectly the same as somebody else's body and that little NGF thing is moved a few centimeters to the right, it'll still connect. And if there's a change in evolution so that you need to move that thing somewhere else, you don't have to retool the nervous system to figure out how to get there because it's, it's an automatically responsive system. And this may be another form of variation of selection. That's, uh, I, I will skip through this. Finally, I want to talk about compartmentation. And this is uh, one of the most interesting, exciting developments in biology the last 25 years. And it's the fact that the embryo is built up of an arbitrary map of, do of domains. In this map, there is no relationship to the actual anatomy of the embryo. It's a little like the map that the European colonists left behind in Africa. I mean, it's just, wherever they divided things, that's the way it is. But what that does is give an address. And each one of those domains contains a unique set of small number of genes that's sort of a barcode that tells you where you are. And that barcode imposes itself on many of the genes of the cells that occupy that space and just tells them, gives them instructions, you know, like, 
disregard this instruction, or grow quick if you see this signal, or die, or whatever. And from this, it allows, it allows each region to have a certain level of autonomy. And these things can be visualized. And one example of that would, for example, be your thoracic vertebrae, which make the ribs, and your cervical vertebrae, which don't. And if you transplant tissue from one area to the other, they say the rib, one, the rib vertebrae, the thoracic ones here, neck, they'll grow ribs. But if you look at the cell types, they're all the same, I and mean, they're making bone, after all. There's osteoblasts and osteoclasts that make bone. And so what's different? Well, there's just little instructions. You know, one might say in the rib one, just keep growing. Another would say, you know, if you encounter a certain signal, definitely keep growing. So little modifications of the signal is all, it, it, and, these, and that's because these different regions come from different compartments. Okay, so, um, so these, the volubility is conveyed by general properties. We listed a few of them. Uh, and, um, and so it's not the totally random process you were often told. It, it, it's the, the stimulus the, of the genetic change is random, but even if the perturbance is random, what's perturbed is non-random, nor is the outcome random. On the other hand, it's quite able to do a lot of new things. So, um, so I think are the useful parallels between evolution and novelty in human design. I suppose you know there's a big danger in in using evolution too strongly as a as a metaphor, and it's been misused as a metaphor. But it doesn't mean it's not inappropriate at some level. The underlying structure of life reveals selected constraint conservation and in turn deconstrains the generation of novelty. Um, actually, even the process of evolvability itself has evolved and we can talk about why that is. And novelty is first introduced in waves of innovation, real innovation, that later change little as innovation occurs in new theaters. It's sort of a moving front of innovation and the processes I mentioned already. So um, that's where I want to leave it. Uh, this was the last uh, sentence in The Origin of Species, that there's a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone slightly on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are, and are being evolved. I couldn't say it better than Darwin. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Dr. Christopher Nagel, a founding scientist of a, a privately, well, a company, a privately, uh, a private lab, uh, Continuum Energy Technologies. He received his uh, Doctor of Science in Chemical Engineering at MIT and a, a, a BS in Chemical Engineering from Michigan Technical, Technological University. He's um, had extraordinary success uh, at raising, I think, 35 million dollars of DOE funding as principal investigator, about 150 granted or pending patents. Uh, he's on the visiting committee at MIT. Uh, he was selected as one of the first frontiers of engineering, uh, under 40 scientists with a national academy. His recent work uh, seems to me more physics and mathematics than chemistry, centering on demonstrating and theorizing variable properties caused in base elements by thermal and optical tailoring, uh, what he calls of, of sensitized elements. He also has a keen interest in, in clean coal to synthetic gas conversion using high temperature and high pressure molten metal furnaces. And he's done significant work in waste recycling using similar catalytic extraction processing, especially of, of things like degraded biological weapons. Uh, my sense as an architect compelled to you know, speculate on emerging you know, paradigms of knowledge is, is that um, beyond the digital revolution is an imminent material revolution. I see architects working on what I call sort of passive variable property uh, materials, whether shape changing or gradient 3D dep deposition. Beyond that, I see scientists already demonstrating what I call active variable property materials, a range of uh, microscopic, often digital processes uh, that are overlaid onto material to change things like surface properties. And beyond that, I see 
someone like Chris Nagel is offering a yet more profound active variable property materiality whereby intrinsic property of base elements can be varied through tailoring. So Chris Nagel. Thanks. It's been a long time since I've given a presentation to a group this large. I think you'll find after this there's a reason why. I, um, hmm. Did you have to press F7 or something? I don't think it needed it last time. Chris Reynolds, any ideas? It just, uh, Let me just check see, out before uh, we got in. I'm just going to see if I can force it. Just see. I have a jump. If it works on the Dell, or if you can figure that it's kind of Apple. Yeah, it's on. Can I ask you to press that without the. Yeah, it's on the. There you go. There it is. No, we got it. We got it. Yeah. Yeah. There you go, Doc. Okay, so. Perfect. So what we're going to talk about is really dynamic property sets, designs for tomorrow. Now, the last time I attempted to give a presentation of this type, it was at NASA with a bunch of rocket scientists, and they gave me a lot of grief on the math, and I told them I wasn't really expecting them to think about the structure of the math, but to look at the form, because I just gave this presentation to a bunch of architects at MIT, and they understood it totally. So I don't know if it's going to be about architecture or about age. But what I thought I'd first do is just give a very brief overview. We're going to be talking about harmonic form in uh, probably every way I know the definition of that word. And then I'm going to go a little bit into mathematics, but only look at it in terms of concepts of how things are organized, the same way you think about a standard equation. Then into property sets and how we can start thinking about properties as knots. K-N-O-T-S, that orbit around what people call a tori, in fact, a quantum tori, the world we live in mathematically. And then I'll summarize what some of these things mean. One of the key defining equations is a third derivative. Now, I never knew what that was, but it turned out General Motors a long time ago named the term jerk. So it's the rate of change for acceleration. It's also the rate at which you can transfer energy through harmonic structures. You stay on that, you're on a geodesic. You don't stay on that, it's going to be like me driving this computer. So overview. I did most of my work at MIT in artificial intelligence, chemistry, and physics. That's where this definition comes in. But ideally, you'd have a property that would be independent of the other structures around it when you wanted it to be independent. That's not normally the way material science works. 
Normally, if you want one property to be at extreme, all the rest are compromised. That doesn't seem to happen in nature very often. So if you start looking at what survival has done, and actually I didn't prepare this slide before I uh, knew what the previous presentations were, but look at how the mantis can change for survivability, but start asking yourself about the chemistry or the physics that's going on there. And over very long time scales, those would typically be considered time scales that typical phase transitions would be occurring in. But it also can do it pretty quickly, right? Same type of thing, but now measured in seconds, right? Those are more indicative of what quantum phase transitions would look like. So a set of variables where instead of arranging all the atoms or all the particles, now we're going to change a quantum variable like electron spin very, very quickly. And nature has taught us also that a lot of times it does this with light. All right, query why. Well, the first time I gave a talk at MIT on architecture, I couldn't understand why Mark would possibly ask me in. Uh, after a couple long periods, I began to appreciate that. But when I look at these structures, I ask myself, what is it? In fact, it wasn't until last year that I looked at the definition of architecture. And this is the one they gave me, habitable in structure, structures. So I really started looking at da Vinci, right? Can I think of that as a habitable structure? I more preferred the second definition, which is more coherence. That's really the area that I work in. So I look at coherence of things like a rainbow, more specifically the coherence in the quantum plane. So here, here we have an example of Euclidean space working with spherical or um, um, polar space, but also the Euclidean plane, which is where most architects work, with a complex plane, which is where most physicists work. In the bottom right, we have the uh, uh, low, energy, low cost housing, but we're gonna replace that with a periodic table and the periodicity in the periodic table, and maybe at the end of today, there'll be new periodicities. And lastly, the general form of what uh, the latest picture out of Hubble, uh, what we think some of the universe might actually look like in terms of those forms. What we've learned in the last 12 years is that light is really pretty cool. Pretty, you know, as Dudley would tell, as a, as a colleague of mine who uh, uh, co-authored, it's unique in the universe. Right? We don't know if it's the only thing that's unique, but we certainly know that it's unique in terms of everything else being referenced to it. We're going to talk to you about new interactions between structure, matter, and fields. Right? You can think of these fields like magnetic fields. You can think of them as mathematical fields. You could think of fields as a coherent structure that you make up in your head. And how using this information, we can start changing properties that physicists believe couldn't be changed. And when you change those properties, you get new, new electrodynamic interactions, and out of those new interactions come new form and utility. A lot of experiments, uh, but the theory predicts that you can manufacture matter out of light. In the bottom here, you have copper, pure copper, that has been light-induced to partially levitated magnet, has reduced resistivity in that spot. Here we have cobalt that ferromagnetically attracts sulfur, again, light-induced. And in the last, running a sequence of, of, of light pulses, turning natural copper into a ferromagnetic material. Now, when you send these out for analysis, people have some problems with them because they don't understand that uh, they actually like to respond like, uh, Mark's hyposurface to uh, being tested. So when you look at the inner core of these electrons, when you test them, they start changing. It's a little bit like my kid when I ask him to load the dishwasher or put dinner on the table. They keep having other things they need to do. Uh, but we've looked at this in the inner orbital structures. We looked at them in the nucleus. Um, they don't like being tested very much on that. But what we have established with testing, a number of independent labs MIT, Harvard, Sandia, Los Alamos, et cetera, is that we can make a wide variety of elements ferromagnetic, elements that uh, quantum says can't be, 
We can change hardness, mechanical properties. We can have catalytic reactions that normally would be uphill look much more biological. Uh, we, can we can tune the band gap in principle. Uh, that's really a crude, that's a, uh, that's way too gracious. We've been able to move it around, but we have not been able to move it to a particular target. What we have been able to do, though, is establish new means for getting quantum coherence, and from those comes new forms of matter. So, a few simple basics. This is the quantum tori, has a hole in it, right? Just like a donut. In the field of topology, it looks for holes, and holes totally define what is possible in inside of that system. It's the analog of a boundary constraint, totally defines it. This is a property. Think of it as matter. So the whole key is how do I link onto this quantum tori, and then how do I orbit systems around it? So the first thing that needed to happen there is we needed to change and broaden. I needed to change and broaden how I viewed geometry, and thankfully Carton came a long time before me. But basically with Carton geometries, you can model anything you want, imaginary and real. And the key is, is that you can now create a complexion of the most homogeneous spaces and the most heterogeneous spaces. Very nice for biological systems are emulating that behavior. But in order to do that, you have to give up all your preconceived notions of what space is. I was once at a cocktail party of a neighbor's, and he says, what do you do? I said, I, I work in space. He goes, what does that mean? I use that line in NASA, too, with the final frontier. I said, no, I, I work right here. He goes, well, there's nothing there. And I said, no, there's a lot there. You just don't understand the structure yet. Uh, he offered to buy me a new drink. The um, topology by mathematicians is considered the soul of math. The example that's used is human beings in 2,000 years. What's going to be common among us? Number of feet, number of fingers. The answer is emotions and irrationality. That's probably pretty common to all human beings. But the key is holes define modern topology. All a manifold is, all this sphere is, is a set of network of equations. If I tell you how many holes are in it, I'm defining what the solution paths to that are. Why is that important? It means that I could take a 3D system, and if I'm looking at it on this 2D projection, which is kind of where we really live, all right, um, to what physicists believe, um, that now what seems to be a miracle can now become a reality. I just have to know how to alter that whole. Another really interesting thing about topology is that it's independent of energy. So you can have a reaction that is way uphill, uh, it takes 100 units of energy to make it go. Topology doesn't care about that at all. All it really cares about is, are you a good seamstress? Do you know how to cut a hole in that manifold? Can you move that hole, and can you seal it back up? The second thing that's really cool about it is that null solutions in, say, three dimension are always solvable in greater than three dimensions. Doesn't mean you know where to look yet. They're always solvable. So if you understand the coherence of that system, you can come up with a solution, you can project it back onto 2D or 3D space. Topology defines the possible. Just think of it like in a uh, quadratic equation, it finds the roots. Those are just holes. And the holes, like black holes, have character. You just have to make sure that when you're bringing this back into this plane, you match it in a very, very particular way, because if you don't match, it doesn't work. Now, these are really unusual equations, but the key is the fundamental theorem of calculus teaches us how to integrate. Not just integrate numbers, integrate energy forms. In these mappings, just think of this as x, y, and z. They're just maps, but they allow us to move around this particular space. So I can now take a, a particle, whether it's a ton or 
a single electron, and I can look at what that is as a knotted form of matter. That's what Einstein tells us, energy matter equivalence. I can look at that as a knotted form with a certain type of coalescence in there, just like a garment that's been woven. And now I'm going to take these, these are harmonics, and I'm going to go from a foliation. So a foliation is just like what you might have in your bathroom. You have a bunch of tiles and you arrange them to form a structure. So the mathematicians call that just like the leaf. They call it a foliation. They put them all together so they fit properly. Change the, uh, change the pattern, you change the optical image, change the pattern here, change the physical property. So the first thing I do is I start out with the base material and I debundle it. I think of this literally as a knot, a K-N-O-T. I debundle it, I reset where I want the zero to be, and then I come back out and I form a new set of properties. This is the matter, this is the quantum tori in terms of how it interacts with the system. So what that really means is, is that the standard marine knots that you may be familiar with are sewing knots or fly knots, these have different work functions. So for the same rope, if I change the knot, I can change its work function or its potential. Anybody who's used a clove hitch or a bow line or square knot knows that. The other thing it means is that if I can change out a zero, I can have the same knot, but with a different type of core, different diameter, different structure. Go to nylon, go to hemp, go to interwoven cable. So here's a piece of copper about 12 years old, where we've been able to make the outside effectively non-reactive to oxygen, just by changing out the knot. Inside of an atom, if you take the old Bohr example, if I knock out an electron, another one's going to change it out, and energy comes out of that, all right? Known to be a constant. If I change that structure, of energy, I'm going to change its dynamical interactions. If I change the interactions, I can change the properties. So the first thing we do is we look at what these, pro what these pure elements look like. This is pure copper, but the machine, because these have historically all believed to be constants, go to a lookup table and they stamp it as being aluminum or sulfur or whatever it is, or et cetera. And it tells you how much you can identify normally for a for a standard material, uh, it can identify 100% plus or minus one, all right? In these materials, it identifies 50% or 50% or 18%. But when you go in now, instead of having the computer stamp it as aluminum and you look at the structure of the spectra, the first thing you see is that these things vary, right? And they don't vary just in amplitude, they vary in position. The second thing you see is that the second, the second thing you'll see is that there's a pattern A, B, C applied to it. So if I think of this knot as this spectrum, if I apply something out here, it's going to change it, if in fact that really exists. And that's what we do here. We have a base condition that's this spectrum. And then we apply different types of patterns, the same way you put a capo on the end of a guitar. Changes what those interactions look like, and they manifest themselves in spectra, which are measured kind of sort of depending on the element between 2,000 electron volts and 20,000 electron volts. To put that in perspective, most classic light is one to three electron volts. Most chemical bonds are measured in hundreds. Well, as we now take those materials and we look, okay, the electronic structure has changed, what's happened to the properties? Well, they become really quite reactive. So pathways that normally would be pretty high uphill, right, like uh, breaking sodium chloride or um, rearranging methane, for example, now can be, now can occur at uh, kind of sort of room temperature with visible light. And very, very long range ordering occurs in these systems. Same thing happens on mechanical properties. So think about taking iron, reasonably 
hard compound. If you scratch it, maybe it's got a mohardness hardness of five. Diamond, of course, is at 10. If you hit it with a punch, it might have a Rockwell C hardness of, say, 45. Stellite, which is used in uh, aircraft landing gears, the highest on Rockwell C is, I think, it's at 62. Uh, if I apply different patterns here, I can make it soft and brittle, hard and brittle, hard and ductile. I can scratch a diamond with it. Uh, and they propagate. They propagate over the bulk, right? And they propagate over a bulk because in our position, not, the mathematicians would call this the not, and this the complement. I work in the complement space. And when I change a complement in three space, which is uh, part of where we exist, the manifold has to change, and as a consequence, its properties change. So we've been able to get uh, pretty wide changes in, in magnetic properties, including making carbon uh, ferromagnetic. Uh, has some interesting MRI uh, implications. Change the reaction rates quite significantly on common materials, particularly in copper and aluminum. Those are the ones we do a lot. Friction. Um, friction in both directions. Pretty interesting on aluminum when you think about that, considering that 50% of all energy is used to overcome headwinds. So what we really want to do is we want to tile entanglements. But I want to learn a little bit from nature. So these pictures, this one I'm going to focus on in particular, it's a bee orchid. No bee on it, right? It's a flower, bee pollinates it, flower takes the shape of the bee. How might that happen? This says that matter, particular forms of matter, act as a filter, the complement, and the complements interact. So if I know that, I can design a system where this B comes in and activates or triggers the complement on the flower. If I know that, then I can use that to my advantage in engineering new property sets. Second, this is where I think ordinary matter lives, right there, 1010. But I can change its functionality if I know how to debundle the system and bring up new structures new energy forms, kind of, sort of, the closer you go to zero, the more control you get, the closer you go to infinity, the more you aggregate those out and get more total energy. All you have to do is match them correctly. It's taken a lot, a long time to figure out how these matchings occur. But you get, you get symmetry, you get symmetry between these equations, they fold on, they coalesce, and they're stable. They're topologically stable. I think that nature has provided an excellent example on this. Carbon, really wide range of physical properties, right, from, from color to hardness to conductivity. The real key is, if this is where the knot is, and this is where the complement is, might you be able to get those same properties by leaving the organizational structure the same? and just changing the energies coming into the complement. So here we have a little experiment where we're debundling a system. We're resetting the zero, and now we're linking it in between. And all we're trying to do is create further and further entanglements. And as we do that, two things happen. The same material attracts iron and it attracts sulfur. I increase my entanglement, I increase that stitching, I increase the surface area and the amplitude of attraction. Just to give you an idea, this dimension is about uh, three and a half inches, this thickness is about three eighths of an inch. So, what do I think? I think that if you go from this space down, you enhance the functionality, the type of rope you're bringing in to form the knot. You're effectively creating an orchestra. And you get to choose what type of orchestra you want it to be, how many pieces, how many slots. Point one. Point two, you can install the conductor. Point three, you can feed it sheet music. So, what you have to realize, there's some new control variables you get to play with. 
And by playing with those variables, you can change out what's going on. So when we think of dynamic response, right? My favorite is optical catalyst. Can we take a material, shine a sequence of light on it, low energy, and have it change the electromagnetic field, the scaffolding, the way biology does, between two plates at large distance, where large distance might be a meter, right, as opposed to a nanometer. Can you take something like, uh, like what Mark has done with the hyposurface and really make it interactive? Um, to energies coming out of the knot complement. Habitable metastructures. I've always thought of a structure as providing shelter from the environments. I'm now beginning to think of it as providing my energy and my water for my house. Uh, and low energy transformations. What possibilities are really there, if, if in fact Mark is correct, in the first architect the first stated architecture was the development of a stitch. I think that's what you told me. They think the origins are. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that if I want to go from an old property set to a new one, I just follow a set of mathematics, and all I'm really doing is creating a new harmonic linkage between two sets of systems. And you can do this with natural light if you know the math. But the bottom line is then, is that you can take a standard material and induce a new property set on it that before it never had. Kind of sort of just like us in this room. You know, we're born with a particular potential and then we learn a lot of new things. Well, you can train copper to do new things. Here you have it with pole independent repulsion, pole independent attraction, and then if I change out the light source, all I'm really doing is changing this complement here. If I change out the light source, I can make it become 80% uh, ferromagnetic. So in summary, I think, I think that most biology works in this direction right here. I think it changes out the topology of the system and there go is change a set of rules it's playing by. I like to think of the 2D surface as numbers, the integers, and I like to think of the stuff that's going back is all of the non-integer numbers. A lot of richness in that particular space. I also think that if you understand how to do that, you can start using low energy light, visible light, sunlight, in particular sequences and form to invoke some very, very unusual reactions that historically have taken us a lot to do. So people talk to me, for example, about desalinating water. Okay, if I wanted to desalinate water at kind of, sort of, I don't know, thousand bucks a million gallons, what type of constraints is that place on the system? So in a global sense, I think every element in the periodic table probably has infinite variations, the same way we as humans have infinite variations. We just have to know how to move down in that dimension. I think that you can start endowing materials with properties that historically have cost us a lot of money, like platinum, and you can endow that or embellish or embed that into low-cost materials. And I think it gives us a new way of bridging some of the complexities that we see between physics and biology and apply them really for some of the global challenges. And so I'll end my presentation with learning from what I call the master architect. We have nature here. We have low cost housing here. I think this was done at, I think the goal uh, was several thousand dollars. Two people had to be able to carry it in and assemble the house in, uh, in two days. But what does nature talk teach us about coherent structures. If this is where we live, the exchange, right, the knot, right, what does it teach us to be able to bring in new forms that are appealing and new forms which are more habitable? That's all I have. Okay, uh, that's a wild perspective. 
So I don't know if, if you would you have questions for each other that you might uh, start with. I, mean, I find each of these perspectives quite quite uh, sort of thrilling um, from an architectural standpoint. I mean, as abstract as it may seem, um, e each of these uh, seems to me to have huge uh, potential to be thought to be thought through. And I think um, architects, um, there's a place in architecture for, for the speculation, the conceptual speculation on, on uh, prescient science, if you, if you might say it. Can I throw it open to questioning um, to either the people in the panel or to people out there? Mine's easiest, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, these things I think are much more complicated. So um, it, it turns out if the quickest, people always ask me, at least socially, um, what, if I'm successful, they actually go the wrong direction. They think that world population is going to increase. They get people get more energy. It's going to exacerbate problems. But um, at least for what I'm doing, the whole issue is just a sustainability issue on the planet. And it turns out if you give people energy, that empowers them. They can make money. And when they make money, they get educated. And when they get educated, birth rates drop. And if you think about what I was telling you about energy, it's the increasing number of people. So in in terms of what I think, in terms of the ramifications socially to what I'm doing is the quicker you get them energy, the slower you grow population, and the slower you grow population, you make the planet more inhabitable. So, of course, I take the most positive view of this, and then somehow it's going to get messed up and we'll kill each other with it, but I just haven't figured that part out yet. I think I'm in agreement. I think I'm in agreement with Dan. It, um, I think the DOE and the DOD have shown that they can't prevent information flow. All they can do is restrict exports. Um, you know, the internet has made everything 2D. And the faster we can get it out, uh, it's going to be like in commodities, in my opinion. You know, you have insider trading on companies, but you don't have insider trading on commodities because the feds believe the fastest the price point can hit the natural uh, value, the better off the economy is going to be. Uh, my, I'm very driven by sustainability. I'm very driven by uh, what you would call low-cost solutions, very focused on using sunlight and I'm very focused on gifting, right? Not necessarily to the developed countries, but certainly to the undeveloped countries. But I believe strongly that education is the key. And the, uh, someone once told me there are very few wars between people that have McDonald's. And it's a, uh, you know, a lot of truth. A lot of truth to the stability of what you have at, at risk. And I think it's gonna be illuminating. Uh, in terms of what I thought I knew and what I think uh, is possible. I mean, one, one thing that history has shown is that the people that predict what the future is, man, are they wrong. <laughs> no. I, uh, I guess I haven't thought too much about the social implications of, of this. Uh, uh, I, I mean, they're, they're um, I guess I'm fundamentally a believer that uh, the more we really understand and know, um, the better ideas we have about how to control things for the good. Maybe not also for the bad, but, but also for the good. Um, that we are the products 
of evolution, and we uh, we know now more and more that uh, um, uh, that evolution is uh, informing our understanding of the human being and other forms of life. So I think on the level of just pure practicality. Um, that uh, it, it adds our appreciation and understanding of, of the way life has originated and, and how it's built and maybe, uh, you know, uh, how to devise, devise medications that uh, take advantage of some of these properties and how to avoid toxic things and also uh, take advantage in the, in the opposite way. Uh, the other aspect of things, um, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to go this direction, but uh, but I, I know, for example, there's a woman at the Harvard Business School who uh, had read this book that I'd written really about biology and went back and looked at how innovation occurs in high-tech companies and drew a lot of parallels. So I think maybe it's an interesting question, um, and she was actually quite excited about that. Um, uh, that uh, we have all sorts of myths about innovation that all make us feel better. You know, there's you know the, the, the brilliant scientist or the brilliant entrepreneur or the brilliant this, the brilliant that. Um, but in fact, uh, we also know that some things um, seem to be easily innovated and some things don't. Some structures do uh, work in a way which they facilitate innovation. And I think it's kind of interesting to look, upon, uh, look at how biology has achieved it, not necessarily because we will follow biological examples, uh, but be, at least that will cause us to question the structures that we exist and, 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 uh, and maybe look uh, at for the underlying um, reasons why they, were, they had the properties they had and, and how they were uh, modified and which ones are successful and which ones are not. Um, for example, um, uh, this exploratory property is just so important in biology, uh, requires a certain amount of freedom to explore. And, uh, and there are people who believe that the freedom to explore uh, is destabilizing. But, but in fact, as we see in biology, um, that uh, even just, now forget about evolution, but all the exploratory systems like the immune system, the vascular system, all these other things, that they're actually very robust, that if you allow this, allow this kind of freedom. So I think maybe, you know, this is on some conceptual level, these kind of understandings will help us emphasize certain aspects of our own organization and behavior, and let's at least think twice about uh, some of our assumptions.